In a city in Persia, three sisters sat at their open window and laughed and joked together. If I had my way, said the eldest sister, I would marry the Sultan's chief baker. If I had my way, said the second sister, I would marry the Sultan's chief cook. If I had my way, said the youngest sister, I would be the Sultan's queen. Now it happened that Kuhumu Shah, the Sultan himself, was walking through the street with his grand vizier. And when he passed the window, he heard what the sisters said. So beautiful was the youngest sister that the Sultan decided to grant her wish and that of her sisters as well. The next day, at the Sultan's order, the three sisters were brought to the palace and the three weddings were celebrated. The eldest sister was married to the chief baker, the second sister to the chief cook, and with great rejoicing, the youngest sister was married to the Sultan Khumu Shah of Persia and became his queen. But now, the two older sisters felt very jealous of the youngest, for she was so much better off than they. When the queen gave birth to a prince, the sisters saw their chance. The child was given to them to care for at birth, but they wrapped him in a coverlet and placed him in a basket and let it float away in a canal that ran near the palace wall. When they were asked for the child, they said, the queen's child was nothing but a shaggy little dog. So again, when a second prince was born to the queen a year later, the sisters floated the child away. But this time they told the sultan that it was a cat that had been born. And the third year, when a beautiful princess was born to the queen and the sisters floated it away, they told the sultan the third child had turned out to be nothing but a stick of wood. The Sultan decided his queen was under some enchantment, or was herself a witch, and had her sent away from the palace to live alone in a miserable hut outside the palace walls. Meanwhile, each year the king's gardener found the royal children as they floated down the canal, and childless himself, he brought them up as his own. He named the eldest prince Barman, the second Priviz, and the princess he called Periazada. When the children grew up, he retired from his post as royal gardener to a beautiful palace he had built. There, when he died, the princess and her two brothers remained, far from the royal court, unaware that they were the sultan's children and rightful heirs to the throne. And very happily they lived there, until one day when the two princes were out hunting, an old woman came to the palace. She was kindly received by the princess, who asked her many questions about herself, and at last asked her what she thought of the palace. Madam, replied the old woman, your palace would be perfect, but for three things that are missing. The first is the speaking bird, the wisest bird that ever lived. The second is the singing tree, the leaves of which form a concert of many voices. The third is the golden water, one drop of which becomes a fountain that flows forever. When her brothers came home, the princess told what the old woman had said and asked them to send some trustworthy person in search of the treasures. Sister, replied Prince Barman, I myself will undertake this search. How can we trust anyone else with things as valuable as these? The next day Prince Barman rode away and turned neither to right nor to left, but followed the road for twenty days. On the twentieth day he saw an old man sitting by the road under a tree and asked him where he could find the speaking bird and the singing tree, and the golden water. The old man put his hand in a bag which lay beside him and pulled out a bowl. Be led by my advice, he said. Take this bowl. When you have mounted your horse, throw the bowl before you and follow it to the foot of the mountain. As soon as the bowl stops, get off your horse. 
Leave him with his bridle over his neck, and he will stand in the same place until you return. As you climb the mountain, you will see a great number of black stones, and hear on all sides voices shouting threats at you. Do not be afraid. Above all, do not turn your head to look behind you. If you do, you will be changed into a black stone like all the others who have gone before you. No sooner had the old man finished than Prince Barman leaped upon his horse, cast the bowl to the ground and followed it to the foot of the mountain. He had not gone four paces before the voices of invisible speakers began to shout at him in tones of thunder. Stop him! Catch him! Thief! Assassin! And soon the voices became such a terrifying din, he turned and tried to run back down the hill. Instantly, he and his horse were turned to stone. But now, her brother Prince Privis insisted upon going to find out what had happened to Prince Barman. The princess begged him not to go, but he refused to listen to her. Before starting, however, he gave her a string of a hundred pearls, telling her, that as long as he lived, the pearls would run freely when she counted them upon the string. And have no fear, my sister, said the second prince. The pearls will never cease to run. And forth he rode and met the old man on the twentieth day. He too decided to climb the mountain and leaped upon his horse and threw the bowl before him. And counting her pearls that day, when the princess came to the twentieth pearl, it caught in the string and would not move. By this, she knew that Prince Privis too was lost. She had already decided what to do if this should happen. She wasted no time in outward grief, but at once disguised herself in her brother's clothes, mounted her horse, and took the road past her door to the mountain. On the twentieth day, she met the old man by the roadside and he warned her too of the dangers she faced. But she stuffed her ears with cotton, so as not to hear the voices when she climbed the mountain. Thus, she did not turn back, and was not turned to stone. On she went until she reached the top of the mountain, and there the voices ceased, and she saw the bird in his golden cage. The golden water was at a fountain close by, the princess filled a flagon she had brought with her. The singing tree was in a small wood beyond. The princess broke off a small branch of the tree and bound it in her girdle. When she had done this, she spoke to the bird. Bird, this is not all. My two brothers, while searching for you, were transformed into black stones on the mountainside. Tell me, how can I end this enchantment? You must sprinkle a drop of the golden water on each stone, said the bird. This she did as she returned down the mountain. Every stone she touched was changed into a man or a horse, ready saddled and bridled. Among them were her brothers who greeted her with great joy. And now the bird spoke to them again. When you reach your palace, said the bird, you will meet the sultan. You must invite him into your palace to see the wonders you have brought. Ask him to stay for dinner and feed him cucumbers stuffed with pearls. True enough, when the princess and her brothers drew near the palace gate, there they met the sultan and his huntsman. When the sultan heard of the speaking bird, and the singing tree and the golden water, he stopped at the palace to see them for himself. Much he marveled at the golden water when the princess poured it from her flagon, for it became a fountain, ever rising, ever falling, never ceasing. And the branch of the singing tree 
became immediately a tree itself when the princess planted it in her garden. And around it clustered great flocks of singing birds, joining with its singing leaves in sweetest harmony. And as the evening drew on, and it was time for dinner, the princess ordered her cook to hollow out a cucumber and fill it with pearls and serve this to the sultan for his meal. For the last of her wonders, the princess had saved the speaking bird. Now as the sultan sat down to eat, the speaking bird flew up and perched on his shoulder. Then dinner was served. The dish of cucumbers was set before the sultan and he was greatly surprised when he cut one open and found it stuffed with pearls. What novelty is this, he cried. And what is the purpose of stuffing cucumbers with pearls since pearls cannot be eaten? He looked at the two princes and the princess for reply. But at this moment, the bird on his shoulder interrupted him. How can your majesty be so greatly astonished at cucumbers stuffed with pearls, which you see with your own eyes, when you can so easily believe that the queen, your own wife, was the mother of a dog, a cat, and a stick of wood. In this way, the plot of the two evil sisters was made clear to the sultan. Immediately, the sultan punished the two sisters and brought his queen back to the palace. He acknowledged Prince Barman and Prince Previz and Princess Periazada as his own children, and they were brought back to the court with fitting pomp and ceremony. All night long, there were illuminations and rejoicings, not only in the palace and in all parts of the city, but extending throughout the kingdom of Persia. When Scheherazade was done with her story, the Sultan said, And to this Sultan too, my queen, new things are revealed. A thousand and one nights have passed, and I have heard from you a thousand and one tales. And as I think back over what you've told me, I understand the foolishness of trying to revenge myself upon all women for the faithlessness of one. Now, for your sweet sake, I renounce my vow. The Grand Vizier was the first to hear the glad news, which he caused to be spread through all the cities and provinces of the empire. The Sultan Sheriyar lived happily thereafter with his lovely queen, Scheherazade. And their names were blessed and respected throughout the Indies and all the lands beyond.